In today's reading of Unwind Your Mind Back to God, written by David Hoffmeister and read by Tarana Singh, we continue with Chapter 3 of Book 1, Laying the Foundation. This is Section 2, A New Interpretation, Part 2, Touching on Form and Content. Friend, what do you do if people attack you, your beliefs, your name, or your status? David, it is a process of starting to disidentify from the beliefs that you thought identified you. In other words, everyone who comes to the world has learned ideas of what it means to be a person or a man and a woman. A lot of the arguments between the sexes get to statements like, men are like this, women are like that. What the Course is saying is that you do not know who your brother is. You have a lot of judgments about him that are based on what you believe you are. The deeper you go, the more you start identifying yourself as a spiritual being. You get away from even identifying yourself with the world. For example, you no longer defend when someone starts to badmouth something you used to be attached to. What I have learned is that when defenses start to come up, it is because of my mind's identification with or attachment to whatever is being challenged, whether it is a particular city, team, hero. Friend and insecurity. David. Yes. It is a sign of insecurity. It is definitely not aligning with the Holy Spirit or Jesus in my mind. As we start to disidentify with our attachment to figures in form, we do become more defenseless because we start to identify with the Spirit or the Soul in each and every one. Insecurity happens when the mind is not so sure of what it is. It has two different voices running. The mind will attempt to use all kinds of defense mechanisms to get around this insecurity or to cover it over. Things like denial and repression or projection. The ego is quite ingenious in coming up with tricks that will minimize insecurity and fear without letting it go. It knows that if you were to ever let go of all the fear and insecurity, it would be out of business. It would not have a life anymore. Defenses are the sneaky mechanism designed to reduce the fear, but not to eliminate it. It is a good practice just talking about these things. I enjoy it when people question and share their views and perceptions. Once I invited a gentleman who was a philosopher to our meeting. We were having lunch and I heard all these groans up and down the table like, you do not want him at your meeting because then we are all going to be in trouble. This philosopher was someone who had a lot of questions and wanted to really get clear on all this stuff. I said, this is great. That is what we want, is it not? 
Why would we want to leave somebody out who is ready to ask questions? In fact, it turned out to be a tremendous four hours of really plunging into things. If someone has a belief or an opinion and you notice a reaction or a defensiveness coming up, it has to be your own perception that is producing the uncomfortable feeling. Jesus was able to come and speak the word because he had transcended the ego system. There was nothing threatening to him, not the Pharisees or any of the different groups that, the, that would come to claim blasphemy. How dare you forgive people's sins? No one but the Father can do that. Jesus was able to remain above the battlefield because of his certainty of who he was. The Course is saying that if you remove all falsity and false beliefs, then you will have that certainty too. There will be nothing in the world that can take away your peace. There is a lot of comfort in that. It helps you to let go of planning and trying to fix people, circumstances or outcomes. It helps you to be more accepting and trusting, knowing that things are working out. All things work together for good. Text chapter 4, section 5. Friend, and there is not just one right way of getting to that understanding, right? David, in form there are many expressions of the universal curriculum, but in terms of content, no matter what the spiritual path is, it is about transcending the ego. In content or a mind sense, they are all the same. But there can be a lot of distortion in discerning between form and content. Content is purpose. Whenever we are speaking of content, we are speaking of purpose. What is this for? As far as schools and pathways go, the course is one among many. It does not answer questions like, should I do this or should I do that? Should I watch the TV show tonight or should I read my course? The course asks, what is your purpose for watching the TV show? Is it to have a distraction? Something to take your mind off things in order to forget your sorrows and problems? What is your purpose for reading the Course? You know, a lot of times people can read the Course and just move their eyes over the words and go, Ah, this does not work, and heave the book. But what the Course does is ask, What is your purpose? That is the crucial thing, not the form. Many spiritualities fall into a pattern of rituals, form, instead of content. If I do so, many particular prayers or um, Hail Marys or so many rites or rituals if I do enough or accumulate enough, that will get me back. But the Course is saying, it is the thinking that is the problem. Your behavior comes automatically from your thinking. So the only place that you can have significant, substantial change is by changing the way you think. There are only two thought systems in your mind, the egos and the Holy Spirits. 
Basically, the course is here to help you discern between the two. The simplest way to identify the two is to see for every cause there is an effect. And there is only one cause with a capital C. That is the creator. That is the cause and you are the effect. You were created by your creator. You were also created in his likeness and image in the sense that he is eternal, you are eternal. He is changeless, you are changeless. He is magnitude, you are magnitude. There is only one seeming difference between the Father and the Son. The Father, cause, created the Son, and the Son, effect, did not create the Father. There are some New Age systems that literally say that I am God. But this path differentiates. Jesus said in the Bible, the Father and I are one. But he always talked about the Father and I. And he would always point back to the Father. Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. That is God. Book of Mark, chapter 10, section 18. He would always point to the Father. The ego picked up on this seeming difference and said, What? Why should you settle for number two? Why, why just be the created? Why not be the kingpin? Why not be number one all by yourself, where you literally can make a world, where you are the kingpin? That is what this world is, where cause and effect are split off. The thought that the son could somehow be separate from the father. Cause and effect are turned around backwards such that it seems that the things that are happening on the screen of the world cause our emotional states. You know how when we were little kids we would stomp off with you make me angry or you hurt my feelings. But that is backwards. I hurt my feelings. Friend, by my thinking. David, by my thinking. Friend, and by my perception. David, if you are identified with the ego, that is what hurts, because that is denying your Christhood. If somebody seems to steal from you or harm you, the world would say, you are just an innocent victim. You have nothing at all to do with that. You just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. But the ghost says that. I am responsible for what I see. I choose the feelings I experience and I decide upon the goal I would achieve. Text chapter 21, section 2. In other words, I can choose to see peace and healing in every situation or I can choose to see separation, defensiveness, etc. A lot of New Age systems will say you are responsible for things in form. But as we were talking at dinner tonight, what happens when you take a mind-level principle like I am responsible for my state of mind and you take a worldly perception from the level of form? Cancer, for example. You put these two together, you get I am responsible for my cancer. Aha! The guilt comes in 
from taking something on the level of form and then taking a metaphysical principle of mind, I am responsible for my state of mind and cross-pollinating or bringing those two together. Friend, that is level confusion. David, yes, that is level confusion. The question comes up straight away. Who in their right mind would choose sickness? And I always say that of course nobody in their right mind would choose sickness. You would have to be operating in the ego or the wrong mind to call forth such a witness in the world. And sickness is a very strong witness. The mind has to believe that it is guilty to call forth a witness such as sickness. The good news is that once we learn to choose and be in our right mind consistently, then we are free of the guilt and therefore we do not call forth the witnesses to reinforce that guilt. That is really the only escape from all pain and misery and suffering. It is like you said, join with Jesus. If you are with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, you can discern between the purposes of the ego and the Holy Spirit. You understand that one is a fear-based thought system and one is a thought system of love. The ego is backwards. It believes that things out there in the world are taking away your peace of mind. But this is the flip side. The ego also tells us that things in the world can bring us peace of mind. I know a particular island that I can picture and just be there. Or, there is a particular thought that is always peaceful to think, but when my attention comes back to my job, I lose it. That is backward thinking, because as long as we think that there are things in the world that can give us peace, or take away our peace, then we are literally codependent. Do not listen to that ego because it is telling you that there are things that you can get in this world that are going to bring you happiness and peace. And it is a scam. It is a scam. It is a big scam. Go within. That is where meditation comes in. Go within your mind. Sink down beneath these clouds of darkness of the ego. Meditate and go down beneath them to the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is within Text chapter 4, section 3. And if you have trouble meditating, then relationships can really speed things up because they will bring up all the unconscious beliefs in your mind. You are dreaming a dream of fragmentation. God did not make this dream. It is a projection from your mind. The first thing to do is to turn around cause and effect. You believe you are the victim of this world that you have made up. As long as you continue to believe that you are a victim with no power, you are stuck. You need to turn cause and effect around and give cause over to the Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit knows that there is no real cause in this world because the ego is not real. God did not create the ego. So what we have to do is to expose the ego. Every time you are tempted to blame anything, your spouse, your job, the IRS, you can choose a miracle. The miracle helps you to remember cause and effect. The miracle also reminds you that nothing has the power to take your peace away. And the thing that seemed to cause distress must not be real. The more we transfer this and practice it in our daily lives, the better we get at realizing that there is nothing in this world that can take our peace away. We are afraid to do this all the time, but as we practice little by little, and the more we start to generalize it, the more we become convinced that there is nothing in this world that can take our peace away. Then instead of being this little bitty dream figure, this little body that is subject to all these forces in the world, we start to see ourselves as the dreamer of the dream. Just like when you are sleeping at night, you go to bed and seem to have all these things that happen. When you wake up, you go, Phew, I'm glad that was just a dream. There will come a time when you hear only the Holy Spirit, the voice for God. You will go, Phew, that was just a dream. And you will wake up to the kingdom of heaven. It makes a lot of sense to apply these ideas instead of just reading and talking about them. Since you actually get happy and your life gets joyful, you can actually sense real shifts taking place in your life. The proof is in the pudding. The more peaceful you start feeling, the more you know you are moving on. Of course, there is no compromise between everything and nothing. As long as you even have a sca scrap of fear in your mind, then the ego still has a door in the door. Jesus is our way shower because when he completely 100% transcended the ego, he became a model for us. He is not tempted anymore by the ego. He knows it is false. Friend, when you meditate, who do you communicate with? How do you communicate or what do you see? I do not know how to meditate. How do you meditate? David, I see meditation as really just trying to be very receptive. There is a lot of chatter when you first start out because the ego does not like your intention to go within. It knows that if you get real still, you are going to start hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit, Jesus, or something else that you feel to call it. And the ego I is very threatened by that. So there is this shrieking yakety yak 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 that goes on. Oh, I got to take care of this. I have to remember to go to the bank and remember to pick up the kids. The mind just wants to race in and get distracted. Use the methods in the workbook. There are guided meditations. 
he starts out very gradually. In the early lessons, he does not put in any structure because he knows that it takes willingness just to be able to put your mind to this course, much less to expect miracles and wonders right off the bat. Little by little, structure is introduced because the mind is untrained and needs a certain amount of structure. But then, in the later lessons, there is less and less structure so that the mind does not get into rituals. The ego would try to get in there in any way it can to make a ritual out of it. So it is all in the book. He will say something like, Try to settle down. Sit quietly. And try to watch your thoughts as dispassionately as possible. See them come and go. If it helps, think of them as a parade going by. He gives you all kinds of analogies and metaphors because he knows that you are new to meditation and he knows that you need some guidance. He literally gives you Zen-like mind training exercises to help you be dispassionate, to watch your thoughts go by. What makes it so great is that he knows that is what is going to happen. He is prepared. It's like a master psychologist designed these 365 lessons. They are really well suited to an untrained mind. Thoughts are like trains. You have heard about trains of thoughts. You are sitting there and you are detached, watching your thoughts go by. And before you know it, you are on the train. One train leads to the next. Then you wait a minute and you hop off the train. Then you hop back on invariably. Then you hop off. Then you hop on. In the beginning stages of meditation, you are going to hop on some of those trains and some of them are going to be thoughts like, I will never get this and I'm not making any progress. I do not know what to do, how to do this. They are just ego thoughts like ego trains. A technique from Christian science for discerning whether thoughts are ego or Holy Spirit thoughts is to put, saith the Lord, at the tail end of the thought. If it sounds ludicrous like, I cannot believe that person did that, saith the Lord. Well, can you imagine Jesus complaining about somebody? You feel it is ridiculous and so you can let that one go. There are techniques like that you can use to start to sort what is in your mind. Friend, there is one point where he says your thoughts do not mean anything and he also says to recognize them for what they are. David, in the workbook, the lessons rotate back and forth between what you think you see in the world and what you are thinking in your mind. To an untrained mind, what is out there in the world seems a lot different than what is in the mind. Say you are at a party and you really start judging somebody. You have the thought, Why am I glad they do not know what I'm thinking about? Or something like that. Because the mind believes it is private. It does not believe minds are connected. And that is why Jesus starts to talk about the perceptual world 
in lesson one. Nothing I see means anything. Then the second lesson continues. I have given everything I see all the meaning that it has for me. A great example of different perception and how everybody reads meaning into what they see is when a group of people go to a movie and afterwards talk about the movie. You get five or ten different views and interpretations. The second lesson brings it back to I have given everything I see all the meaning it has for me. It is not that the events are giving the meaning or telling me how things are happening. It is the thoughts. In lesson 4, he literally says, These thoughts do not mean anything.